Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, there's someone you really need to know more about. He is Ollie Robbins, the Prime Minister's chief European advisor. Her Sherpa, to use the European language. He's a public servant, and his job is basically to help deliver Brexit. As far as that's concerned, you might say he's the second most important person in the country after Theresa May. Although David Davis and Boris Johnson might beg to differ. Uh, I suspect if you don't know Ollie Robbins' name already, you'll get to hear it this year. But don't wait, because our political editor, Nick Watt, has been scouting around, looking at what Mr Robbins is up to. Brexit is the most radical change of direction for this country. The idea that any bureaucrat could be in favour of radical change is a nonsense. The civil service may well have its own agenda, uh, but ultimately, with a strong government, it should be the government's will that the civil service implements. I don't think that watching him with three prime ministers there'd ever be a moment that he would be in any way patronising about the fact that he ha you know, has more information at his fingertips. He's one of the tallest men in the British establishment, with one of the lowest profiles, yet he wields some of the greatest powers. He's never at the centre of attention, but he's always in the room by the Prime Minister's side. Ollie Robbins, Theresa May's chief advisor on Europe, is being dubbed the real Brexit secretary, possibly eclipsing David Davis. Beyond the world of Whitehall, most people have no idea who Ollie Robbins is. But day by day, he is shaping the nature of Britain's departure from the European Union. He has the Prime Minister's ear in Downing Street, and he's in the engine room for the nitty gritty of the Brexit negotiations in Brussels. Well, every European Prime Minister or President has an Ollie Robbins, uh, has someone who works closely with them, uh, whom they trust, uh, who uh, is in permanent contact with all the others. These are people who telephone each other, email each other, text each other. Uh, the actual formal meeting where we all see people sitting around a table for a split second, that's the tip of the iceberg. A recent advisor to Theresa May says Ollie Robbins has a knack of winning the confidence of Prime Ministers and senior Mandarins. Ollie was somebody who really uh, had the full trust of that team, um, had the full trust of the Prime Minister, had the full trust uh, of Jeremy Hayward uh, as well, uh, and was able to really sort of own meetings and run meetings uh, in, in a way that made the, the process uh, very smooth uh, and very effective. Um, and probably one of uh, just a few officials who actually sort of had that level of, of trust and access, I think. So what are the instincts of the man shepherding us through this defining moment in British history? A good starting point is the place where his worldview began to take shape. Ollie Robbins embarked on the first steps of what must have looked like a classic journey through the establishment when he studied politics, philosophy and economics here at Oxford in the 1990s. But there's a twist. He chose Hertford College, which, despite the wooden panelling, has pioneered a much more inclusive admissions policy. An Oxford contemporary, who later worked with Ollie Robbins in Downing Street, had an inkling he would go far. Even at, at university, it was already clear that this was a guy who was going to make a, make a success of, um, of whatever he did. Um, I think it's fair to say he, he, he's the sort of person you'd, you'd be more likely to see in tweed than in a, in a football kit. Um, you know, but that phenomenal brain was very much there. But also that sense of humour. The intellectual clout of this modern college in an ancient setting was shown when Ollie Robbins and three other graduates of Hartford controlled intelligence at the heart of Whitehall. The Hartford gang say it was a conspiracy that never existed.
I've spoken to one Tory Brexiteer who went to a grander Oxford college and is wary of Ollie Robbins. They're all commie geographers, this Tory told me, of the Hartford College alumni. Brexiteers were delighted when it emerged that at Oxford, the young Ollie Robbins had written that the Soviet Union wasn't all bad. I understand that David Davis, the actual Brexit secretary, who has something of a prickly relationship with Ollie Robbins, has a habit of opening meetings with him by welcoming colleagues to the Ollie Robbins People's Soviet. Everyone reportedly has a chuckle, but some Leave ministers are suspicious of him and regard him as a classic civil servant who sees Brexit as a crisis to be managed rather than an opportunity to be seized. I was, as you know, uh, a member of the Thatcher government. We came in and introduced a radical change in economic policy. And all the officials were aghast. Uh, they thought it would be a disaster. But we had, a, at that time, a strong cabinet led by an outstanding prime minister. And they accepted the leadership, the political leadership, as is their constitutional duty. If a soft Brexit is being negotiated, it must be the will of the, the Prime Minister and her Cabinet. How can we possibly be in a position where uh, the Cabinet and the Prime Minister has a certain direction, but the civil service is taking it a different way? That surely is a sign of a weak government. Ollie Robbins fears that the Cabinet Brexiteers Notably, Michael Gove and Boris Johnson are on his case. He worked hard to win them over in the run-up to the Prime Minister's EU speech in Florence last September, making changes on the way. But in the tense week in December, when the Phase 1 Brexit negotiation deal appeared to be on the verge of collapse, there was some frustration in the Cabinet Office that those ministers were less supportive. Well, I think inevitably because of the role that Boris and Michael played during the uh, Leave campaign, um, clearly they uh, are big figures who, who need to be part of this process and brought into it. And from what I've seen, I think Ollie um, uh, deals with them and their offices very uh, effectively um, and again brings a level of diplomacy to, to the whole thing. Deep in the basement of the Guardian newspaper lies one final clue to the character of Ollie Robbins, ruthlessness tinged with impeccable manners. Angle grinders and drills were wielded by senior Guardian editors to destroy files which had been leaked to them by Edward Snowden. Ollie Robbins had issued a stern warning to the Guardian that its continued possession of the files marked a threat to national security. He brokered a deal where the files were sawn to bits in an operation supervised by government agents. Punctiliously polite was the Guardian verdict on their Whitehall adversary. So a consummate Whitehall operator with experience in the smoke and mirrors world of intelligence is guiding the Brexit process. But in his mind, the painful business of cutting deals and making compromises lies in the hands of his political controller. Nick, uh, what there? Nick's with me. Nick, it was interesting to hear Nigel Lawson, Lord Lawson, so wary of the civil service's role and their mindset and their ability to kind of thwart all of this. Yes, that's right, saying that civil servants would like to frustrate it because it goes against the grain so much. But those remarks have clearly uh, struck a nerve, a raw nerve in Whitehall, because the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Jeremy Hayward, has this evening rallied to the defence of the civil service. He doesn't speak out that much, but he has issued a statement to Newsnight uh, after those comments by Lord Lawson, which crucially were about the civil service in, generally, in general. And uh, Sir Jeremy says, look, the civil service take great pride in supporting the elected government of the day in their mandate, and the mandate, the mission of this government is obviously to deliver Brexit. And he says, the civil service is putting enormous effort and many of its very best people into making a success of the project, that is Brexit. And then he says, interestingly, it is being tested on a daily basis, and I'm very proud of what we have so far delivered. OK, so he... 
It's a sensitive point, but the civil service strikes back. Nick, yeah. thank you very much.